just go ahead and get started. So, um, so hi everybody. Uh, welcome to our July Value Scout webinar: Double Your Clients' Revenue with a High-Performing Sales Organization. Uh, I'm Jason Malicki. I am the CMO of Value Scout, and uh, super excited to have James Rory's here. So, I'm going to give him a, a, a quick introduction. I've actually known James for over a decade, and all the things that you saw promoted about him are all all true. So, um, he's a veteran builder of high-growth companies. He's been an enterprise sales leader. He's participated in three public events and a number of successful exits. Uh, as the founder of the Flourish Group, he's worked with over 6,500 middle market companies, family businesses, startups, global enterprises. The part that I want to highlight is just all the data that we put in there. So, so James did the study of, of, uh, of his clients over the course of two years and found that over that two-year window where they had been working together, they generated over a billion dollars in pipeline $286 million in new revenue and an average annual growth rate of 151%. So um, I, the reason when we started building out this platform in the beginning, I wanted to have James on here was because one of the things we talk about at Value Scout is this idea that usually the number one block to an owner's exit is value, that value is not, is not there. And, uh, and I felt like, well, at the heart of value is revenue and at the heart of revenue is sales. So really felt like we needed to have someone on like James who could kind of talk us through how do you build a high performing sales organization. So um, this is an open Q&A type session. So, um, you know, it's designed to be interactive. I encourage you to ask questions as we go. This is not a slide deck. There is a slide deck here, but it's only just for reference. Um, and uh, for the most part, we're just going to riff here. So, um, so I'm going to just jump us right in here. So, James, just tell us about you. Tell us about Floris Group. Kind of give us, you know, beyond the, the the bio that I threw at everybody. Tell me, tell me, kind of your. Just tell us your story. Sure. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, one quick correction: uh, average annual growth rates as high as 151 percent. Um, thank, but th <laughs> thank you for the intro. Did I overinflate? We got to make sure the data. Marketing trick? We got to right. make sure the data is right. Is that the reason? Is that the difference between a marketing person and a salesperson? No. Yes. Yes. Hundred uh, <laughs> percent. Outstanding. Uh, well, you know, my I've been doing this for thirty years. It's pretty wild. Uh, I left grad school in '91, and uh, it just blows me away. Um, it, it's, <laughs> at that that time has flown. Uh, but it's funny because in '91 I had three things going against me. I had the arrogance of my MBA, the <laughs> arrogance of my youth. I can't relate to that. Right. <laughs> and I had the arrogance of being raised an entrepreneur. Uh, and for anyone, I was part of, I was fourth generation of family business. And, and uh, you know, for anyone that's lived through that, there is a, if you really buy into the entrepreneurial uh, mindset and lifestyle, you know, you end up believing there's nothing you can't do. There, so there is a level of arrogance that, um, you know, the world is your oyster. So it's just a matter of figuring out where you want to focus. And uh, that, but those three strikes against me meant that I could not really find a job and stick with it. I was unemployable. And now I look back and know this, but at the time I didn't recognize it. Um, I just wasn't going to be able to go work for someone else and be successful. Uh, you know, and I didn't know I, at the time. I, I, I laughed because I, <laughs> I had, this, I was the same person. I remember I interviewed at AMD, that's the silicon chip company down in, in Texas. And I went in there thinking that I was going to set a corporate strategy. <laughs> they laughed me out the door. Like, what are you talking about? Get out of here. So I, 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 uh, I relate. Wow. 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 <laughs> well, I, you know, you gotta, gotta think big, right. To go big, I guess. Um, so after bouncing around, I founded a, uh, uh, consulting practice. I, I found a mentor in town that was going to help me out. And for about, uh, for a number of years, uh, we, we built a consulting business and I even had a radio show. Uh, we did radio show, half hour shows during drive time, five days a week, uh, interviewing successful executives. And, and this was all pre internet, right? We were, st we were yeah. still, we were still making the transition from the DOS interface to windows at this time, <laughs> just so everybody has some, some perspective about what life was like back then. Um, I had my luggable uh, Mac um, from, from uh, school. Um, but over that time, what happened was I was able to uh, co-found a couple companies and um, have some successes and then leverage those successes into uh, a move back to Boston where I had my education, met my wife there. 
and uh, I got involved in the internet bubble. Um, and that was, that was from about um, the end of 97, all the way through the end of 05. And uh, so during, during that time, I really learned how to sell uh, in that early consulting phase. I learned how to apply that knowledge to a startup environment. Now, these were raw startups. These weren't huge venture-backed startups. My first few companies, they were grassroots, you know, uh, uh, bootstrap type businesses. And we were really trying to figure out how to sell something to someone um, who had never heard of us to solve a problem they didn't know existed. So it yeah. was the hardest type of selling. And we had no customer, no way to back us up, no brands that were recognizable. How do you do that? And so I learned how to do that. <laughs> And then I took that to Boston and got involved with a bunch of other, other venture-backed startups and had some a number of successes. And in fact, the first company I joined was a wild success. And the problem there was it feeds your arrogance, right? So you know, you, you feel like, hey, I can do this now multiple times. This is and, easy. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you don't realize how lucky you got. Yeah. Well, let's jump into the, I want, you know, um, I highlighted this at the opening, but it's like you know, the, the, the reality that businesses simply aren't worth enough for the owner to exit and retire. And, right. I, you know, and like I said, my hypothesis at the very beginning of this, when I first got introduced to Value Scout, like, well, the problem is the top line problem. It's probably a sales problem. There is not enough revenue for the business to have the value it needs. So right. I guess I want to get your take on that. You know, what is the role of the sales organization in value creation? Like what, what, what how important is it? Am I, am, you know, talk to me here. Yeah. Well, you know, the, um, it, as a salesperson, my focus was on, was on driving transactions, right? So, and what was great about my experience, those first 15 years of my career was I worked really hard and I was very dedicated and it was really by pure sheer force of will that I really was able to become a top producer in nearly every situation I was in. I actually became this mercenary where I would move from startup to startup to be the guy that could land those initial early stage deals. Wow. And I was closing million dollar accounts on, on vaporware, you know, things that weren't really baked yet, not because I manipulated somebody, but because, Hey, I, I was, I learned how to solve a problem that they had. And even though our stuff might not be baked, it was the best solution they had access to. So I was able to, to create those transactions. Now in Flores, where we're building now pipelines that can actually drive predictable growth, we have to think differently. If you're a business owner thinking about sales as an accumulation of transactions, then you're gonna underserve your business. So it's not just an issue with top line, it's an issue, it's an issue with predictability. Okay. Can we build a model that's going to give us predictable, repeatable um, ability to drive that top line? When you're trying to build value in a small to mid-market company, whether either because you want to be the acquirer or be acquired, uh, it's about the future value that you're going to build into your company. And it's about the leaders, people, and systems that you can bring together in a systematic way to drive predictable outcomes. And that's where value is created from the sales perspective. So is that really the difference between having sales people and having a sales organization? An organization has the ability to make something more predictable, whereas a salesperson is only as good as their, their individual capabilities. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, think about and think about your business, right? So if if you're if you're the kind of owner who is who just views salespeople as hired guns, um, coin operated, and they're basically, <laughs> you know, we we dehumanize the, dollars out, right? We dehumanize the sales profession into coin operated, you know, individual, and I can just move them in and out of my business, no problem. Yeah, that's one way to go. But if you don't have an organization to plug them into then every person you bring into your organization is going to change your company. They're going to bring their own process, their own style, their own accountability frameworks. And when they leave, they're going to take those with them. So if you're just hiring people to come in and provide you transactions and there's no system behind it that you can plug them into, in other words, a system that will survive them, then you yeah. end up becoming hostage. You, be, you become held hostage to those top performers and you're afraid 
to do anything different that might that might disrupt the boat. And what ends up happening is they control the future of your business. Everyone else in the organization um, is treated differently, and you have dysfunction. You don't have systems, processes. The way to go is to build that systematic approach, identify the predictable path to success, and hire people who are going to fit the roles that you've identified yeah. in your organization and build it systematically. And unfortunately, you can't fake it until you make it to do that. A business owner has to hire somebody who's done that 50 or 100 times because they have to know how it's going to work inside your business. You have to have somebody involved in your business that has done that before so they can show you the way, build the system, and then get the hell out of there so you can reap the rewards. But you cannot fake it till you make it. You can't just throw shit against the wall to see if it sticks. It's just not going to get you there not fast enough. You. What I love about what you said, and I want to just kind of drill down on this a little bit, is just that you, know, you think about positioning a business to sell. You're positioning it for an exit in some way. Um, essentially, what you're saying is it's having a repeatable sales organization with repeatable process and structure is really what's valuable to the acquirer. Right. At the end of the day, if, if sales is just transactions, it's just people doing deals all day long, the likelihood that that's going to continue on is lower than if there is a very structured, repeatable process that has been built on behalf of the organization. So it's, it's, it's a risk reduction mechanism, and it's also a, a confidence mechanism. It says to the right. buyer, the, 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 the performance this company has, has can continue. Um, so I love that. I love it. I love it. So... Um, actually, I'm going to grab a question from Sarah here. We have, I, I'm encouraged, for those of you who are just dropping in, this is an open dialogue. So I have, I have a script of questions that I want to ask James that I have been burning to ask James, but you can ask anything you want. And if, if it's any good, I'll ask it. If it stinks, I'll leave it on the floor. <laughs> All right. So Sarah says, when we're talking about predictable results from a sales organization, are we capping the view at the point of contract and renewals? Or are we talking about all the way through fulfillment and client service, i.e. the entire customer experience? So, right. um, you know, I guess maybe the question is essentially, is, is, the, is, the, is the sales organization inclusive of client service delivery as well, all the way through the, the, in your, in your okay. mind? Uh, Sarah, I love the question. It, it, feels like, um, it feels like you're a plant in the audience because it's, it's really the perfect question. Um, and I'm going to step back a bit. During my first 15 years, uh, Jason, the persona that I built for myself was one of a, you know, hunter gatherer, like I was that mercenary that would just go get wins, no matter what the cost. Yeah. And the problem with that is having a salesperson that's so committed that they'll do it no matter what the cost, as long as it's legal and ethical and everything else, but you can still bring in comp business that's not best for the company, right? Business that isn't profitable. Uh, and employers can be so desperate that they overpay you for the value you bring. My last sales job, I was earning three, I was earning 25% commissions on sales that I would make, even on extended term deals. So I was, so they were overpaying me because of the scarcity they felt about driving revenue. So a salesperson get, that's just focused on that can really cause a lot of problems and damage to an organization. What, when I decided to leave that life and uh, for many reasons change my viewpoint, I adopted the servant leader mentality as a, as a principle by which to guide me as I dealt with customers moving forward. And this is, this is the cultural imperative that I recommend to every business that I work with. And why does this connect to Sarah's comment? Because when you're, when you're thinking about applying servant leadership in a business world, in a high growth sales world, it can be challenging to do, but it can be amazingly rewarding if you get it right. Servant leader means we serve shared goals and we lead our customer down a shared path to change. The idea here is that people buy when they're ready, willing, and able to change. And so we adopt and practice sales as a leadership competency. And we develop those folks, that leadership competency, and think that way first. And then what happens, Sarah, inside your organization is if you're developing a growth company and you want a growth culture, now you can Im implement a culture that includes your sales team, servant leadership. We're going to find 
shared goals and lead them down a shared path to change. It's highly ethical. It's highly intentional. It's got a lot of integrity attached to it. And you don't have an organization that says, you know, like I've been in plants before with, with words like integrity and customer first and customer centric on the walls. And what they really meant was that applies to everyone except for the sales force. Because <laughs> the sales force is out there, you know, getting pelts. And, you know, it's just, you know, it's just a totally dysfunctional um, environment. And so, yes, you have to think holistically. You have to recognize sales is a team sport. And yes, you have to be thinking about the entire customer experience because it all contributes to top line growth and the system that you're going to build. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I think it's, uh, and I love that concept of, 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 you know, there are good sales and there are bad sales. And if you've built an organization that enables salespeople to make bad sales all day long and get compensated well for it, they will do it all day. So you have to be mindful of that. So, um, okay, so let's talk about the common blocks, you know, so for a sales organization that's not performing, what are the common blocks that you see when, when, when a company is struggling to, to sell, the selling organization is not performing? What's going on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Easy question, um, right? Soft well, question. you know, it's, um, it's a, a lot of the things that I bring to the table really begin with the belief system that you bring to, to the table to solve that problem. So when you think about um, how human beings are, uh, um, are raised and how society tells us to solve things, right? If you have a pain in your head, you take a pill, right? So we're taught to address the symptom instead of look at what the root cause might be. Now, again, this is a silly, simple analogy, but as a coach, right? And I've been, uh, I've gone, I went through 10 years of training, formal training, um, uh, to understand how to coach executives and leaders through this process. So there's, there's experience behind those 6,500, um, more than 6,500 relationships that I've built over the years. Uh, sometimes we, we know these things. Yeah, pill ver you know, for the pain versus look at the root cause. But we don't think about that rule in the context, in every context to which it can be applied, like building our business. So we see revenue isn't coming in. That's a lagging indicator. That's a symptom of okay, something okay. going on. Yeah. Now, an owner might say, ah, that means I have crappy salespeople. Uh, well, okay, let's look at the fact that you might have a crappy salesperson. What is that a symptom of? Could that be a symptom of you as an owner, right, not respecting the recruiting process? And hiring people because you feel good about them, right? We have you have. Or it could it be that you're just not recognizing the fact that that candidates are much better at interviewing than you are, right? Could it be that that your that your system for identifying a top producer might be able to be improved? Now that it doesn't stop here. Think about this. That, that in and of itself could be a symptom. The fact that we don't have a great recruiting program, what could that be a symptom of? It could be a symptom of a root cause or that is a belief inside the ownership or the leadership of your organization that says it's impossible to have a sales organization with 100% of the people in that organization being a top producer. I had a client that sold his business I'm guessing for around 300 million bucks. And he was interviewed and somebody asked him, have you ever met a top performing salesperson in your life? And he said, no. Now this company was a top performer for 15 more plus years before it was, it was sold. But this, this owner was able to do that without ever really t paying a good, a close attention to a sales organization. And, and the belief system that he had built was that, you know, salespeople are, interchangeable and there's no such thing as an amazing salesperson why because he never saw one i can tell you that is not that does not have to be true so what we have to do as sales as business owners is that we have to think about you know what is the symptom that we're looking at what's what could be the root cause oftentimes and i may get a lot of hate mail for this <laughs> uh, 
oftentimes it's really the mindset that the owner brings to the table that yeah. limits the potential for their organization. And my job is to come in and identify any kind of any self-limiting beliefs and challenge those and then kind of introduce slowly the things that we know to be true and then make sure that we can execute against them in, a, in an effective way. It's funny because I thought where you were going to go when you started was that, you know, the, the question of do you actually have a viable product to sell? Because a lot of times uh, I, I, I'll see clients and they'll say, well, you know, our marketing is not working or our sales not isn't working. I'll say, well, yeah, but you don't even know what your value proposition is. You don't understand, you know, what, was your product any good? Maybe your product is, is really not as good as you think it is. Um, and so that you're, you're basically putting people on the front lines to sell something that's really hard to sell. Yeah, so, yeah. all right, so let's move ahead. Um, one of the things I love about James is that James is a very data-driven guy. So if you spend time on his site, there's just data kind of falling out of everything. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a mathematician at heart, so I love data. So, um, you know, one of the things, I'm going I'm to re repeat this data because I loved it. You know, you said, so you studied 10,000 sales interactions. So you looked at 10,000 sales interactions across your client base, and you said that 94% of salespeople make the same costly mistakes every day. Right. So, um what are some of those? What are the mistakes that salespeople always make or routinely make that are just blocking success? And how do, you know, as advisors, how do we able to help our clients avoid them? Right, right. Well, so. Um, or some of them, obviously you can't yeah, you know, rattle off all of them. Yeah, so we have, and we have a very um, pro well-proven and well kind of very mature process that we take organizations through very simple, very programmatic. Why is that? Is it because every business is the same? No, it's because the issues that affect businesses, the, um, the challenges, the mistakes that businesses make are very common. They're very similar. Um, it's not, it's, it's the, the, the causes of the challenges. Uh, it's not rocket science to figure that stuff out. Um, and so it's very easy for me to talk about the kinds of things that 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 um, that salespeople get wrong, but what I'd like you guys to understand is that there's there's really two ways that two places you have to look. One is the salesperson themselves, because human beings are pliable, right? And they're they're uh, they're a function of their mindset, as we've already discussed, with their belief systems, that skill set, and the tool set that they have to bear to bring to bear on their job. So think in terms of mindset, skill set, tool set. Why is this an important um, paradigm to think about? This is where we start when we start thinking about an organization. You can give someone a tool like a hammer or like a phone or like a CRM system. And uh, if, you, if you don't train them to use it properly, right? will they ever use that tool? Can you ever expect them to use that tool appropriately, let alone in a way that's gonna drive exponential growth, get you to a place you've never been before? Likely not. So you give someone a tool set, you have to give them the skill set. Well, what good does it do to put someone through training if their belief system, if their brain that says, this training is a waste of time, it's never going to work. I don't believe that I'm actually learning something that's going to be effective and going to help me do my job, right? So we hear uh, there's a lot of noise out there about what can and cannot work today in sales because there's a lot of people trying to sell you their wares. And so your people... Oftentimes, their mindset about what can and cannot work changes, not just every day, but with every win and loss that they, that they come in contact with. Hmm. The other thing is you got to think about where your salespeople are. Are they at the beginning of their career, pro stage or master stage, right? So there's a level of development that we all go through as human beings, beginner, pro, master, where are they on that continuum? And are you as an organization going to help them get to that next level? So that, that helps you think about the challenges that salespeople bring to the table. So what kinds of mistakes do they make? They make the mistake that believing picking up the phone doesn't work. They make the mistakes of believing that writing long emails somehow is going to get someone's attention. They make the mistake of believing that social selling is an automatic win for the organization, right? We know that that's just not true. They make the mistake of following the market, meaning uh, paying attention to all these seminars out there about how you can leverage LinkedIn to grow your business. By the time you have 50 people emailing you or reaching out to you on LinkedIn 
every week trying to espouse how to leverage LinkedIn as a tool, it's years too late to leverage LinkedIn as a tool to drive your business. You've got to find the next way to go. You've got to find a different way to approach using that tool than the market is telling you to use it. So they make the mistake of following versus leading. Other mistakes that salespeople make is they, as human beings, they lose discipline and lose motivation with every win and loss. Um, what can help a business owner um, keep that discipline and that focus in place is by active, through active management, through active accountability frameworks. Probably nine out of 10 businesses that I talk to, the first thing they'll admit to is that we don't do a good job holding folks accountable, right? We also don't do a good job of training our people on the most predictable, repeatable way to win a deal. Uh, so one of the quick questions I ask is, what's your fastest path to cash? If I was going to start here today as a salesperson, would you be able to show me exactly what steps are involved in driving a deal and what, what's going to get me to, the, to a, a successful buying decision quickest? Most organizations give someone a computer, a cell phone, a list, and say, go get them tiger or some version of that, <laughs> right? We hire people, we throw them against the wall to see if they stick. You're saying that doesn't work. That's not, that's not well, effective sales training. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, in the context of our conversation today, if you want to build value for your business, right? We just have to think about this stuff in a little bit deeper way. If you've got an assembly line and you, and you understand that assembly line and each step in that process down to the second or split second or millisecond, and you know what movements are going to optimize flow of your product out the door, you know, it does seem reasonable. If that builds value for the, manu on the manufacturing delivery side of your business, wouldn't it also build value on the top line sales side of the business? If you could build that same kind of, of structure and predictability yeah. into the process. Having a belief system that says it's not possible, one, we develop that typically because we don't think it's possible or we've never seen it work and we don't know anybody who's done it before. Okay, fine. Let's just assume that if you're going to achieve something extraordinary as an owner or as a founder, you're going to have to think differently. You're going to have to do things that are extraordinary. Go find someone. Don't go find a sales trainer who's going to focus on skill set when your tools are broken and the mindset isn't lined up. Mm -hmm. Go find someone who can focus holistically on your organization. Have them think about not just the training they're going to deliver to you, but the business case they're going to deliver to you. Hold them accountable to helping you double the size or the double the value of your business. See what kind of partners you can find who can take on that challenge, position the challenge that way, and, and engage those folks, not the folks that bring you point solutions and, um, and frankly, just keep you kind of spinning on that hamster wheel, missing out on the big payday. Yeah, I know it's awesome. My brain's firing in a million directions and there's so many questions I want to ask, but I also want to keep us on track. So I, we have a couple of more questions actually coming from Sarah. So if anybody else has questions, feel free to, to, to throw them out there. I'm going to grab a couple of hers here. Um, she asked if you can share an experience when the sales organization was influenced by, uh, connected to the client's service experience and financial outcomes. Um, in other words, lessons learned downstream can improve process upstream. Um, Ah, so excellent. I'm curious if you have any, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, you know, Sarah. Um, I mean, there's multiple business models out there and revenue models that we look at, right? So there are models that say, look, when I go sell to a business, I only have a chance to sell them one thing once. Like, let's say I sell ERP systems or CRM systems. Those are that's an enterprise wide sale. I'm going to make it once, and I'm probably going to move on to the next deal. There may be ancillary services that are sold in, but not by me as a salesperson. It's going to be done by the customer success team as they go forward. There are other businesses out there that would sell to a, to a single buying center inside a business, and there might be multiple buying centers. So as a salesperson, if I, if I can get a wedge into an organization and find one happy customer, now my, my, the, chan the odds of my success now selling to multiple buying centers throughout that organization will be predicated to some degree on how well we deliver on that first experience and subsequent yeah. experiences. So in that case, the salesperson is gonna be directly tied to the quality of the deliverable. 
in that case, I have a, as a salesperson, if I'm that salesperson, I have a natural connection now to bringing a client in and making promises that can be delivered, that can be sustained. If I can only sell, if I'm only selling to somebody once and walking away, um, there has to be an incentive built in for that salesperson not to over-exaggerate, make promises that can't be kept, et cetera, like we all have experienced as buyers before. So what you've got to do is if, if, if your priorities are such that you want to maintain a complete and, and positive customer experience from beginning to end, then you must build in incentives and you must build in checks and balances to make sure that um, that, that kind of that, that, that objective is, is wholly met. So you don't want to have a compensation plan for the salesperson that is counterintuitive or contrary to your ultimate objective. You don't want to allow, for example, the salesperson full control over writing the proposal and pricing. You want to control yeah. pricing somewhere else, right? I mean, there's, there's things thought, we, right? yeah, we, there are things we work in there. Now, the other thing you can do is you can bring a customer success person in to the sales cycle. The other thing that we oftentimes do is we think about, look, if, if we want to make sure that, we're, that the customer success folks are not surprised by an unusual deal, then maybe we, we force the customer success team to be, in, to be brought into those deals. But before they can be brought in, the salesperson has to answer 10 or 15 qualifying questions that the customer success team is going to require, meaning it, it, those are qualifying questions that the customer success team would then identify and say, look, is this the kind of client that we want? And so you're kind of enforcing now a best practice on the sales side that comes from customer success that now kind of wakes up the sales team and says, you know, it's not just anybody who has a checkbook and ready to cut a check. It's someone who's going to fit um, our definition of, a, of an always buyer. And we have this concept internally of always sometimes and never buyers, which is a critical component of how we get started with people. But um, those are some things to think about. If, if sales is a team sport, then we have to think about how all the traditional silos that exist, customer-centric silos from marketing, think about demand generation, lead generation, think about prospecting and appointment setting to sales, to then the, the transition team and the delivery team, and then there, of course, are going to be folks that are focused on uh, getting use cases and um, recommendations. And then, of course, the sales team is going to want referrals. So that entire yeah. life cycle has to be considered a team effort. We have to do everything we can to knock down silos between the organizations that are responsible for that. And we, we of course, have identified uh, ways to do that. So you can, you can actually have everyone working together instead of competing and arguing with each other. If you can accomplish, that's what you have to accomplish. And there are ways to do that. But it, to your point, it's not easy. It is a challenge. And it, it really just requires focus and commitment to get started and a belief system that it can be done. And then, of course, you will find the ways to take down every one of those challenges as they come up. You know, it's interesting. As you were talking, I had this, and I'll be fast. I had this thought in my head that um, you know, it's not even just it extends beyond the organization. So I, I uh, some of you know, I, I run a podcast and our podcast is, is professional services focused podcast. And we did the series where we interviewed high growth professional services firms. And a lot of the IT services firms, um, their, their sales model is built around service, assisting the customer success group of large SaaS platforms. You know, So they build deep relationships with the customer success leader in a certain area of Salesforce, but you can only imagine what's going on in that customer success person's reality. The sales, the front end of Salesforce sold this huge deal. Now they're designed, they have to go make it actually a reality and it's really hard and they can't do it. And the client's frustrated. Well, they have these partners that kind of they bring to the table. And so it's sort of like the idea that like, it's like their sales, customer success, oh, and their sales again, inside of another partner organization. And, th and that alignment between the two ended up, ends up being, huge growth channels for, for small to mid-sized IT services firms. So I'm going to jump ahead. We have another question from Mike I want to, I want to throw out there. It says, mm -hmm. um, so to James, how often do you advise a client and find that the sales compensation plan has to be redesigned in order to improve the performance of the sales organization? 
So great question. I, you, you were just touching on comps. So I was like, we got to go there right yeah. now. So, well, it's, and it sounds like that question comes from a, uh, a base of experience. So I would tell you that there's never a situation that I'm, that I'm working on, on hiring with someone where comp doesn't come up. Uh, now the, it's interesting, you know, one of the things that you mentioned earlier, uh, Jason was that, Hey James, you didn't mention, you know, is this product viable? Well, the, the businesses that we, we work with lots of startups. I've worked with over a hundred startups just here in Columbus um, over the last say eight years. Um, whether it's a startup and startups, we have to look at market viability, of course, but when I'm working with small and mid market companies, that viability is less of a question. What's more of a question is how do we communicate the value proposition, as you said, to, yeah. to the people that we're selling to. It's the same kind of thing with hiring. Um, we know that we can sell our stuff. We know that salespeople can sell. The question is, how do we create that ideal fit with our organization? Compensation is just part of it. But if they're coming to work with you just because of compensation, that's going to cause a problem. Right, because what we want is we want someone who is an ideal fit, who's motivated to get up and come to work every day. So they have to be a cultural fit, they have to be a role fit, they have to be a goal fit, and then the compensation plan first can't do any harm. In other words, take their eyes off of all the other priorities that you have in place, in addition to closing deals. These people have to enter your organization and not disrupt the organization. They have to contribute to the uh, growth culture. They have to contribute to the positive mindset inside their organization. They can't come into work and be constantly complaining about marketing's not doing enough, yada, all these other things. They have to be focused on what they know is going to work and focus on what they can control and focus on doing their part, playing their role inside the larger organization. Compensation cannot be the reason they're there. And you also want to make sure compensation isn't the reason they end up leaving. So it's a, it's a, it's a very delicate balance. Yeah, I love the way you answered that. Well, and, and you also cannot just look at your PL or your income statement and say, well, I can afford to pay this much. That is a horrible idea. You, <laughs> you, right? I mean, if you want to hire beginners or people that aren't proven, that may work as long as you can develop them into successes. But you have to recognize that just like you're competing for business in the marketplace, you're competing for the best salespeople and top performers are only going to work. They're not going to go where the comp plan is the highest. They're going to go to the organization where they, can, where they can earn the most for the time they invest in that, in that experience. Top performers want to get paid like anybody else, and they're going, to, they're going to evaluate an opportunity just like an investor. Am I going to maximize return, my return for the investment that I make in your company? And if you don't have the systems around them to help them be successful, if you're going to force them to do everything themselves, if you're going to if you're going to kind of leave them out hanging without a lot of support, not a lot of, not, not a lot of management or coaching or other types of ways to, to help support them and help them advance their career, they may only come to you for the money, but they will leave you as soon as another investment opportunity, a better investment opportunity comes along. All right, I want to jump ahead because I, you know, you, you know, I want to get into your new growth curve. Yeah, so you've built something called the new growth curve. I want you to talk about it, what it is, um, you know, and how it aligns with value creation. I'm going to pull it up on screen for everybody so they can see it because it's a, there's a really, it's helpful to see the visual. Um, so let me do that. Um, but I just really want to kind of get inside of this a little bit before we run out of time because we are coming up on time. We got about 15 minutes left. Sure. And just get you, give you a chance to talk a little bit about the, about the new growth curve and what it is and how it works. Sure. Um, we, we go through the, gr the growth curve in detail on our website, uh, floristgroup.com. There's a lot. We're, we're really an open book, very transparent organization. Um, and so check it out. The, it's described in three stages, lead, leverage, lift. And um, when, we, when we went and did our research on our most successful clients, and we looked at 10,000 uh, working sessions. Um, we didn't know what to expect, but here's, here's what's compelling about this curve. One is that it, it represents uh, the path that our most successful clients took to success. This is, a, this is a, we call this a predictable path to success because it's representative of what they were able to accomplish by working with us. And we, we developed 
tailored, customizable relationships with each one of these customers. What this has created for us now is a single standard way that we can engage now everybody that we meet. So those organizations now don't have to pay for a large custom engagement. We can get started uh, at a very, uh, very simple, reasonable way because now we know actually what we what questions we have to ask and how exactly we're going to do this for every one of our clients. So that's the first thing. It's it it makes it more um, we can we can serve more people. Uh, the other thing about this curve is that notice it's an S curve, but it's a reverse S curve. Most S curves most S curves start by going down and then going up. The uh, S right. I mean the S curve. Yeah. You know you you assume you have to make an investment and take losses before you can start earning. This is entirely different. If if you've got a business and you've got a sales organization or a single salesperson that's successful, we should be able to come in on the lead stage and implement, in the lead stage, we implement um, a sales operating structure. So we create the supports around the salespeople that make what they do predictable and repeatable. And it's tailored entirely to the sale, to your organization, to your company, your industry, to your customers, how they buy. And uh, once you implement this, or even as you implement it, you find that growth rises. Um, in this stage, uh, in this stage, we're able, we were able to achieve an average forty six percent improvement in revenue just by focusing here with your existing team, your your existing infrastructure, by making changes that gave everyone a sense of exactly what the dance steps were. Everybody moves in sync. Everyone's thinking about how they can contribute to the process. And when you have that kind of organization and common theme and common mindset, all led by somebody who takes responsibility for managing, coaching, and holding folks accountable to the system, not because we want to whip out the stick this is not a carrot stick idea. This is a, this is accountability in the context of creating motivation because by holding you accountable, I'm now going to help you improve. I'm going to help you see where you're making mistakes or you're adding time to a buying decision or you're positioning yourself. This is a very common mistake. You're positioning yourself for a competitive sales cycle. Actually, a lot of salespeople create an environment where their customers have to go out and, and find competing bids. A lot of salespeople have practices that cause their customers and negotiate price. So we can eliminate a lot of those challenges right away and just naturally create that, that bump in revenue. That's why the curve goes up um, ex, you know, exponentially in the beginning. It levels so, off. Oh, go ahead, please. No, I guess what I'm interested about is, you know, is so you really when you when I look at this model, it's it's really starting with the people that are in place, right? It's like making sure that right. the team that exists has the right mindset, the right skill sets, and the right tool set to be successful. And you're basically saying you lift there because you right, you lead there, but you start there because there's probably an innate. Um, lack of sales performance that we can get at right away. Yeah. Well, think, uh, think about we it. Start. Jason. Yeah. Yeah. Think about, think about dinner time at your house, man. I have a neighbor who's got 65 nieces and nephews. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> now if, if, imagine, imagine the family reunion. All right. Now imagine if there was one fridge and nobody, and there was no organization to mealtime, and everybody was going and making their own meal, doing their own shopping. Imagine the chaos. That's what most sales organizations are that just hire people and say, go get them tiger. Figure it out. If you can hit your number, I don't care how you hit your number, go do it. You have yep. chaos that cannot be controlled. It can't be managed. It can't be directed. The energy, there's so much energy that's wasted. So we're just not allowing you to waste that energy. We're giving you the structure. Yep. To, to get rid of that chaos. I love that it starts with mindset because I, 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 don't, I don't have anywhere near the depth of knowledge as you, but just, it just it seems like that's the biggest lever for most salespeople is that they don't, they don't have the right mindset. Um, right. If, or, or I should say, if they're not succeeding, they don't have the right mindset. Um, so anyway, keep going. I'm sorry, I didn't mean yeah, to cut no. you off. No, it's great. So lead stage, now we, we level off here at the leverage stage. At this point, now we're making an investment in 
in our people, right? We're thinking about optimizing role fit. Do we have the right people in the right roles? Well, in order to understand whether I have the right roles, I have to understand strategy and structure. So we, we take a step now and think about, you know, is the team deployed in the proper way? And then we think about developing the, the specific sales skill sets of leaders and the salespeople. And then we translate those into playbooks, playbooks yep. that can be, that can capture all your, your own sales IP. So I help organizations think about, imagine if your approach to selling, you owned it and it became your intellectual property. Now we're starting to think about, you know, you know, rounding out that systematic approach to driving growth. So when you bring somebody on board, you can, you can walk them through a playbook. They're not just shadowing people and trying to, trying to, you know, garner these pearls of wisdom. You've got the playbook. And what, what's cool about how we do this is we actually take the training that we walk, we walk you through. We give you the training in the context of a playbook with all the customizations that you created in the context of that training. So this is not, we don't have a training model that says, come back to us and relearn everything over and over again. Our training model is go through it once, customize it. We put all the core training and, and your customizations in a playbook and say, see you later. We want to empower you to create a, to create value in your organization that you can that you can actually transfer to the next owner that's cool yeah i love the idea of a playbook and i also love it i love it in the context of value creation just this idea that now there's a there is a defined agreed upon repeatable process by which sales happens here wherever here is um, and it seems to me like if you went to a buyer and say, look, here's our playbook. This is how we get deals done. This is how we've gotten growth in the last five years. And here's how you can get growth in the next five years. Suddenly, I, I, I'm not a valuation guy. I'll leave that to the, the valuation folks. But I got to think value goes up, right? It seems pretty simple. Like I have a heck of a lot more confidence in what I'm buying when you give me that versus when you say, yeah, Bob in the corner, he's awesome. He crushes it at sales every year. I don't know what the hell he does, but man, he is amazing. Right. You know, well, um, that's well, a scary I'll, thought. Yeah, well, here's a here's a dirty little secret in the industry. Um, you know, we all have heard the statistics that you know 80% of MA transactions fail to deliver, you know, on the promised value that they that they once that they expected, right? Well, that's not just because the acquisition was a mistake or because the acquired company wasn't what it was meant to be. The acquiring company oftentimes has a lot of problems. Um, I will tell you that the dirty little secret here is that the very few acquiring companies could even identify a well-run sales organization. <laughs> so they, they may be acquiring you for the sales organization, or they may be involved in an acquisition strategy uh -huh. that, that um, they think that, say, again, they're, they're thinking the same way maybe you used to, that sales isn't as critical. So, you know, there, a lot of transactions occur when you know without paying attention to the sales organization and what you can do is if you understand the value built in your organization you can position yourself much differently in a in a much better situation than those who uh who didn't make that investment you can actually educate your acquirer that's really cool all right you want to talk about lift before we run out of time because yeah. we, we, we kind of we, we cut out we cut out leverage i'm also curious um what SEP is, you know, you okay. to, I know what there's, CRM there's, is, but I don't know what SEP is. There's little, is. there's little writing at the bottom that, that explains it, but CRM is your customer relationship management system and, and SEP is your, your sales effectiveness platform. It's, it's a new way of thinking about technology that's evolving where we look at CRM as just a component, but we want to think about how, uh, to Sarah's conversation earlier, you know, how does customer success and what are all the customer success tools that we can bolt on? Uh, to CRM, and then what are all the marketing, uh, demand gen, lead gen, prospecting tools we can we can bolt onto CRM? So now you have a sales effectiveness platform that can um, the tools the tools you require the tool set to support the uh, this this evolved idea of how of how your sales team can operate. Yeah, got it. Cool. Yeah. All right, let's talk Lyft, and then we'll, yeah. we'll take us to close here. So real quickly, Lyft, you can see the curve now continues to go up. And uh, what we're doing here now is because we understand lead, our sales operating structure, we have that 
identified. We now know how to get the most out of our people. Now we're ready to hire people. Yeah. Before we hire people, we want to create integration with our marketing team. So now the sales team knows who it is. Now we can create the integrations required with marketing and customer success to create a full customer centric platform, a customer centric approach to, to driving top line growth. And then we can look at redeploying our workforce, right? So this idea of workforce redeployment is very important to us. Right people, right roles. We can do that again. And then we can identify what gaps we have in our organization. Now we can fill yeah. those with the right people. So it's funny. I'll, people come to us oftentimes and say, look, Jimmy, I want to recruit. And I say, great. Why would someone come want to work? Why would a top producer want to come work with you? Why would a beginner want to come work with you? If a beginner is going to come work with you, you have to be able to develop their career. What, what are they going to learn? If a top performer is going to come to you, what kind of supports do you have around them to ensure them that they're going to optimize or kill their number? Um, if you can't bring that to the table, you will be subjected to the mediocre salespeople or the salespeople who can't get jobs, right? We know that 76% of all salespeople are unhirable. We know that 85% of sales managers are unhirable. They will kill your business. But you will be subject to those poor performers if you can't demonstrate to the market that you have a sales organization worthy of the higher performers. So it's a chicken the egg challenge. But if, you've, if you're struggling with mediocrity in your sales organization, it may be because you're not attractive enough to the top performers out there. And startups and young organizations struggle constantly with this because typically the people that they're exposed to who are coming to apply to the jobs at their organizations are folks that really can't get viable employment in organization with the accountability frameworks and the structures required to get the most out of them. That's a, those are staggering statistics. I'm dying to get underneath them, but we can't. That's based on so, 2 million. That's based on 2 million evaluations yeah. over 25 years. So it's, it's, those are real numbers. Yeah, I really want to, we may want to do another session around those things alone. Just, 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 you know, how do you avoid hiring those 76 and 84 percenters, yeah. um, which it seems like it's a staggeringly important thing, you know, that because, you know, the cost of a hire is, I don't, my, my hypothesis is, you know, we always talk about the cost of a bad hire, but it seems to me the cost of a bad sales hire is actually bigger than the cost of other bad hires, right? Um, because there's so much lost opportunity associated with it. So, um all right, so we, I, I know you actually have a hard stop at once. So we're going to wrap this, um, you know, here. Um, I want to just real quick, thank you so much for joining us today. I um, really, really enjoyed it. You know, you, you have such a great, so much great energy and so much great thinking on how to approach this topic of building a high value sales organization and so much great experience having done it. So um, so I, I encourage, you know, our advisors on the line, if you have clients that are struggling with this type of sales, uh, you know, sales growth or sales acceleration, I encourage you to reach out to James, obviously his emails on mm -hmm. uh, the screen there, as well as, you know, reach out to Floris. Um, I'll give a quick plug for our July event because uh, James kind of threw the statistic out there for us. He basically said 80% of integrations fail. So we're going to talk about that. We actually have Hanna Rama coming to talk about um, leadership and cultural assessments so that you can avoid that, you know, help your clients avoid that either uh, when they sell or, or if, I guess, if you have clients that are acquiring. And then, of course, Jason, if you want a, a demo of Value Scout, the URL is there. Go ahead, James. Sorry. Awesome. Yeah. Before we wrap, I just want to quickly give some uh, the listeners some access to some free tools that are out there. Cool. Uh, if, you, if you go to our website, there's a tools section with with access to lots of tools that can create some self-evaluations for any of the clients that you're working with. Um, and all those come with um, a free 30 minute a session if you want to get insights into what they actually mean for your business or for your client's business. The other thing is that we actually, uh, I'm actually a co-host of a podcast ourselves. It's called Moving the Rock. It's available anywhere you hear podcasts, Moving the Rock. And it actually walks through the first 25 chapters of our Sales Leadership Academy, which actually goes into great detail about how we achieve that first, um, that first gain in the lead stage of our, of our growth curve. So there's a number of episodes there that go into great detail. All of it's available for free. Um, and um, you know, I hope, you, hope you're able to take advantage of it. 
All right, man. Thanks. It's awesome. I, I, yeah, I definitely check it out. Like I said, I've known James for a decade and I, I promise you that, that you cannot go wrong with anything that he is uh, going to going to give you as advice. So um, thanks everybody for joining us today and look forward to seeing you online. We'll have a recording of this up in the next 24 hours if you want to access it. And thanks for your great questions. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but uh, have a great day. Thanks. See ya. Jason.